FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 1-15-18. Well, the month is already half over. It's not like anything didn't happen. Markets keep roaring along, and hey, contact us, reach out, join us, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. So markets still continue to make new record highs, stock markets, that is. Interestingly enough, though, precious metals are going up along with the stock market. Well, one thing that's been really slaughtered as of late is the mighty grain back. What are these trends portend for the future? Well, John Rabino is with us now. John, happy Monday. Hey, Kerry. Uh, yeah, um, this is a very deja vu kind of feeling now when you look at it, the, uh, the financial markets, because uh, everything is behaving pretty much like in early 2000 with tech stocks and in 2007 with housing stocks, except it's it's most asset classes. Um, stocks are through the roof and commodities are spiking. And, and uh, it, so it definitely has the feel of a blow off top. And you can't know that until after the fact, obviously, but this has that feel. So we'll see how it goes. But a really interesting time right now and a really familiar time. And as you said, at the same time, gold is going up. And it's it's got a lot of gold bugs wondering if this is the final uh, you know phase change out of the correction that began in uh, 2011 and then just ground on until um, this past year. So it's it's possible that as one of the only undervalued remaining assets, precious metals will be one of the things that outperforms going forward. Just because you know they're down where everything else is up. So if you've got profits in Bitcoin or tech stocks or real estate, you want to take a little money off the table and protect those gains. Uh, you can either leave them in cash, which is, um, you know, a zero cash flow investment. You don't make any money if you just have a bank account or, or cash sitting in some other um, storage area. Um, so given that, Precious metals become very interesting because they tend to outperform just just plain cash over time. You know, gold was two hundred and some dollars an ounce in two thousand. Now it's thirteen hundred and some dollars an ounce versus the dollar. In other words, it's gone up against the dollar pretty consistently over the past um, couple of decades. If you ignore the the you know several year swiggles in between. Uh, so if you've got a lot of cash that you're raising from selling assets that are way, way up, precious metals look like an interesting place to put some of that cash. Uh, that could be what's happening now. You know, people are taking profits in, in one thing or another, and they're using some of that money to buy gold and silver. Um, is that sustainable? That'll be the question. Uh, you know, the commitment of traders report, which is a snapshot of what happens in the paper markets, uh, turned very, very bullish about a month and a half ago. And then as gold and silver rallied, it has swung back to bearish now. So using that one indicator, you'd say that this is just yet another, you know, swiggle driven by the paper market, doesn't matter much, but there are bigger forces at work. So we'll have to see how this turns out uh, to see whether capital flows from one asset class to another out there in the world, some of which is flowing into precious metals, um, swamp the games being played in the paper markets. You know, that's out there as an event that's almost guaranteed at some point, but we won't know whether a, you know, a hundred point move in gold is just paper market squiggles or the beginning of a big sustained move until after the fact. You know, you gotta wait and see um, to get full information. As, as Henry Kissinger used to say about foreign affairs, you, you have the greatest freedom of of action when you have the least information. And as you gain information and have a clearer picture of the world, you, uh -huh. your um, choices collapse down into just a couple. And that, that's the way it is with financial markets. You know, you can do anything when it's early in a move. Um, but as the move progresses and you start to see um, what the move really means, then there are only a couple of things that make sense at that point, And you've missed a lot of the early opportunities. So we're kind of in that place with precious metals, which means that um, 
this is almost useless speculation and you should just yeah. be dollar cost averaging as always, you know, just buy some more silver coins this week and, and add a few gold shares and, and gold mining shares and don't really worry about this stuff. Uh, you know, this is more a conversation for obsessives like you and me who <laughs> deeply care about what happens in gold and silver and want to catch every single move. You know, that's that's my perspective. I don't want to miss anything. So it matters whether, you know, this hundred point move is the beginning of a big trend or or nothing to get excited about. Well, the commitment a traders report would seem to be saying or indicating that it's nothing to get excited about because the positions have gone back to the old standard where the speculators are all in and on the long side, the commercials are where they usually are on the short side. And as we've seen in the past, that will normally lead to at least a short period of decline until things sort them out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how, you know, the commitment of traders works until it stops working, right? Well, see, that's the thing. It has worked. <laughs> you know, if you traded off the commitment of traders report for the past three or four years, uh, you'd have done very well. You'd have been a successful trader. But eventually, the, the bigger forces out there, the fundamentals, which are that we're creating um, vast amounts of new paper currency and um, fractional reserve credit out there um, in relation to the, um, the amount of new gold and silver that are being mined. So the, the gap between paper and physical continues to grow. And at some point, those things have to be brought back into balance. In other words, we will have to have a monetary reset in which we either via government action or via market action, we kind of recreate, we can reconnect the world's fiat currencies to the underlying monies that they used to be based on, which are gold and silver. And you need a price for gold and silver that reflect the supply of fiat currency that's out there. And, and people who run those numbers say $10,000 gold is what it will take. So out there is an event or um, a, a major trend change that brings that about. In other words, gold goes from $1,300 an ounce to $10,000 an ounce. Uh, and during that process, it won't matter what games are being played in the paper markets. You know, speculators can be long or short, the commercials can be long or short, it won't matter because the uh, the amount of capital that is flowing from paper into physical will be so immense that it'll swamp the uh, the futures contract games. So we know that's going to happen. <laughs> and in the meantime, um, we also know that there are tradable squiggles. But you, what you don't want to do is go all in on you know one of these tradable squiggles where you um, sell all your gold and silver or you go short gold and silver and and miss the big move when it happens. You know, the last thing you want to do is be right long term about an asset class, but be out when you really need to be in. You know, if you miss the big move after being kind of sort of a gold bug for for 20 years, then you will feel stupid for the rest of your life. So it, I, I think that um, everybody should have um, a certain amount of physical gold and silver that they don't touch. You know, that's that's not trading capital. That's something that sits there as insurance against the eventual monetary reset or some other kind of financial crisis that requires you to have real money because uh, funny money, you know, fake fiat currencies don't work anymore. Uh, and then with what's left over, you know, you can you can trade, you can play games in the paper market and try to increase your return by catching these 100 or 200 point moves in gold and, and three or four dollar move moves in silver. Um, which the Commitment of Traders Report has allowed people to do for the past few years. So that, that's kind of what I do with um, with options on mining stocks. I will write covered calls on the, the big optionable gold and silver mining stocks when the Commitment of Traders Report looks kind of bearish. And so if the stocks go down subsequently, I get to keep the cash from writing those covered calls. And that's worked out pretty well. Uh, you know, but then you also need to own physical precious metals um, as part of the, um, you know, the precious metals mindset. You need to own some of those that you never trade. They just sit there and you know that eventually they'll be worth orders of magnitude more than they are now. And at that point, sell them and convert them into real useful stuff in the in the uh, in the world. You know, a house, a car, food, land, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, we're 
we're in this really interesting point right now. And by the way, we'd be remiss if we didn't refer to cryptocurrencies. I'm going to the Miami blockchain conference. There's going to be 4,000 people there. My friend Jeff told me when he first started going to Bitcoin meetups, you know, meetup.com, all these different affinity groups, interest groups, there were 15 people at the meeting. The last meeting he went to, John, there were 700 people at that meeting. I can't even picture. If you could have sold them something, you could have done really well, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, that, gold. That, that's really the uh, the most bubble-ish asset class right now, even more so than tech stocks, and that's cryptocurrencies. Now, whether this is a, a monetary phase change where cryptocurrencies end up taking over the, the global financial system, or um, it's already a late stage bubble where something's going to happen to blow them up. You know, and, and we're seeing a lot of things that, that that point to that possibility. We can't know this either until after the fact. You know, I think blockchain technology looks like it, it has uses in a lot of different places. So it, it's completely conceivable as one possible scenario here that, um, that Bitcoin doesn't end up playing a very big role in the world. But blockchain technology ends up replacing a lot of the other wealth transfer systems that we have right now. Um, Another possible scenario is that um, one of the 1,500 or so other cryptocurrencies that are out there turn out to work better than the big brand name ones right now and end up taking over. You know, that that's analogous to the early computer market where the, the, the first brand name computer makers fell by the wayside, even though they were big and powerful and, and famous for a while, but they didn't end up having the uh, the best mousetrap. You know, somebody else came along and, and, and invented something that worked better, or many people came along and invented things that worked better, and they ended up being the, uh, the ones that dominate the markets today. So all of this is possible with cryptocurrencies, and you also don't know how governments are gonna react. You know, the, the big story in Bitcoin, and cryptocurrencies in general, was South Korea this last month, where uh, the South Korean government, it, it, government announced that it was intending to basically ban cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Um, and that caused turmoil in the market. But then they walked that back and said, well, we're, we're considering it. <laughs> you know, we aren't doing it just yet. <laughs> yeah. Until, um, until the prime minister can get rid of his digital wallet, we'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We made our profits. Now we don't want you to have any profits in cryptocurrency. Well, that's only fair. Um, but um, see that all of that stuff is out there. And it's all possible. You know, you don't know how governments are going to react to cryptocurrencies. You don't know whether um, um, they're going to grow fast enough quickly enough to just, um, you know, decimate the existing structures of the global financial system. You don't know whether um, competition within the cryptocurrency market or oversupply within the cryptocurrency market is going to be a big factor. You know, all of this stuff is unknowable. So it's a fascinating thing to watch, but it's a really difficult thing to trade uh, and certainly a hard thing to invest in because, you know, these markets are, are they're, they're brand new early stage markets. And this is how it happens when something new is invented that looks like it's going to change the world. You know, you've got a hype cycle and you've got rapidly changing technology and you've got the, uh, the existing power structure reacting to this apparently big change taking place in, in their ecosystem. And, and you just don't know how it's all going to play out. But it's fascinating to watch. And you know, leaving aside all the, the chaos that's going on in the cryptocurrency markets, I got to say, I love the concept. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. private sector technological money um, that exists independently of governments and central banks and regulators is, is a really interesting libertarian idea. And I sincerely hope that it succeeds on some level. I just have no idea what that level is going to be or how the, the details play out between now and then. I have to tease something here, John. So mm -hmm. there's a cryptocurrency coming out. I can't say any of the details about it other than the fact that uh, I believe it will be the most significant one introduced since cryptos were created whenever that might have been 2009, you know, however, whenever it was, it was a while back. I believe this is going to be the most significant and uh, potentially transformative event that you know, it's just going to blow you away what's going to happen. So anyways, I'll just leave it at that. But I think it bridges the technology issues. It bridges all of the issues uh, because basically, you know, all cryptocurrencies are faith based currencies, right? True. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, we depend on governments to manage these currencies. They aren't backed by anything. They don't have any kind of physical reality. Um, and 
So fiat currencies are completely faith based. Now, the, the question with cryptocurrencies is what is their intrinsic value and, and how do we measure something that, that doesn't have a physical reality, but also isn't dependent on a government keeping a promise. So that's that they exist kind of um, in a new category and that's still to be worked out too. And gold and silver are the opposite of a fiat currency. They exist in the physical world and nobody has to keep a promise for gold and silver to be valuable. They have been objectively valuable for 3000 years and they have no counterparty risk. So you, you've got these different categories of money out there and they're, they're all jostling now for a place in the global market. And it's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out in the future. You yes, know, I suspect is. real money wins, but um, but how long that takes and exactly how we get from here to there is uh, is still something that's got to be decided. Well, it's going to be bigly, that's for sure. And it's going to be major. Uh, the transformation that takes place. I'll tell you more about it later. By the way, if you want our paper, our white paper on cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, uh, just email us, kl at kerryletz.com and just tell them John sent you and we will shoot it right out to you. It's free, no cost, and help give you the basics that you need to start thinking about the space. Well, you know, the tax cut there, John, it's like it keeps on morphing and it keeps on, you know, more and more, more and more things keep coming up. They're cutting electric rates in certain states. And I believe that they will cut electric rates across the country because every electric utility, I, investor owned utility, they're called IOUs, is regulated by the state in which it transmits power or generates power. And we're talking just the ones that have the grid, the ones that actually generate power in their own independent power plants, not really relevant. But uh, they have to go before the state public utilities commission or council or every every state calls it a different thing. But every state has one. And one of their recoverable costs is income taxes paid, federal income taxes. You, the ratepayer, the electrical consumer, actually pays for the company's income tax out of your rate paying dollars. So when a cost goes down significantly in a state, uh, except for perhaps Texas and a few other states that have been dramatically deregulated, the utility is automatically forced to extend the benefit or a portion of the benefit of that tax cut to the ratepayer base, to you, the electrical consumer. and. And this will be the case with the uh, investor owned water utilities and a number of other public utilities. And as a result, places like Washington, D.C., they just filed for rate cuts and it's all from the uh, tax cut. So I just find it kind of uh, entertaining to see the law of unintended consequences work in the people's uh, for the people's benefit for once, because <laughs> nobody was thinking, John, when let's cut taxes so they'll cut people's electrical rates, right? No one was thinking about this, but it's going to happen around the country now. Yeah. Well, well, people respond to to tax rates. Um, my, my concern is that um, corporations were already re reporting record profits and they were mostly using that money to buy their stocks back. So uh, it's, it's not clear that a tax cut is going to generate that much positive behavior because it increases profits that were already at record levels. Um, but it's nice to see markets responding in a, a useful way, you know, giving people a break or, you know, some banks paying out bonuses or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, one interesting thing that happened last week, though, too, was McDonald's where or not McDonald's, I'm sorry, Walmart, right, where they announced an increase in the minimum wage yeah. um, tied to the, the tax cut. And they paid out some bonuses and did some other good things for their people, which looked great. You know, it looked like the tax bill actually having a positive effect on the people at the lowest level of the economy, you know, McDonald's greeters making more money. Um, but uh, then on the same day, they announced they were closing a whole bunch of Sam's Club warehouses and laying thousands of people off. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, you know, it, you know or, um, they, they give it and they take it away at the same time. Well, and close, I think yeah. that's a big. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say they're closing 63 stores. The average store employs about 175 people. So it's about 11, 12,000 people that will lose their jobs or lost them. They just closed them right away. 
uh, no, no, nothing. They just said, all right, these stores are now closed. Right. And that was it gone. <laughs> so yeah, they did uh, take away on the one hand they gave with the other, but well, right. See that this illustrates uh, the, the, the forces that are at work out there because people want um, a higher minimum wage generally now, on the assumption that that lifts more people out of poverty and, um, and increases the, the amount of money that's flowing to the people who really need it, you know? But at the same time, that increases the, um, the incentive for companies to automate. And what Walmart did was they converted their, their converting their Sam's Club warehouses to e-commerce distribution centers. In other words, when you buy something at Walmart online, uh, they're going to ship to you from one of these distribution centers. And that's a form of automation. You know, e-commerce is basically automation where we're, we're substituting technology for store clerks. And to the extent that Walmart is doing that, um, they're using technology basically to replace their workers. At the same time, they're paying the remaining workers a little more. So is that a, a net plus? You know, if, if you're one of the guys who still has a job, I guess it's it's good for you. But if you're one of the guys that got laid off, the process did not work in your favor. And so we're, we're seeing these two forces now where uh, companies are feeling compelled to pay their their lowest paid workers more, but they're also feeling incented to get rid of more and more of those low paid workers and replace them with robots and other kinds of technology. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see how this plays out and what the net effect is, but it's definitely a mixed bag. You know, you, you um, are seeing technology really move up the food chain now because artificial intelligence allows machines to do things that require thought. You know, you can replace a store clerk in a store with uh, an automated system now that, um, that reads a signal from your phone and then goes and gets the shirt that you want from the back room, brings it to you, and then takes the payment also over your phone without a human being ever having to be involved in that. Yeah. You know, that, that's where retailing, that's where bricks and mortar retailing are going. It's still not going to be labor intensive. It's just, it's going to have a physical presence, but it won't be employing a lot of people going forward. No. And that's true everywhere in restaurants. You know, the, this recovery has been called the bartender and waiter. Mm -hmm. restaurant yeah. or uh, recovery because that's who we're yeah. hiring. You know, we're hiring service people, but those are the guys who are going to be put out of work by the next generation of technology. So that that's a very scary process. Yeah, well, agreed. So that is it. Just find John's work over at dollarcollapse.com, ours, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for both our newsletters. And John, uh, oh, be part of the show. Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at kerrylutz, and Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. John, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Kerry. See ya. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.